My name is uh, Michael Gibney. I'm the uh, president of uh, Genesis Robotics. And basically, uh, James and I started this company about seven years ago. We were into working together and really trying to figure out what we're going to do. And about two and a half years ago, we decided to go all in in specifically Genesis Robotics, creating uh, the Live Drive, which I'm sure we'll be able to tell you about shortly. So I'm James Clausen, uh, Chief Technical Officer at Genesis Robotics. And so I, I lead a team of engineers and technicians and machinists, and, and we rapid through ideas and, uh, and look for discoveries. And, and the uh, Live Drive is, is uh, an example of, of how quickly we can move through these, uh, these ideas and discoveries, and, and uh, it all came together uh, in the last two and a half years when we started this project. In the last, uh, I'd say, year and a half, we, uh, we brought together these, uh, these foundational discoveries into something that we knew that we needed to put all of our focus on. Because I can't understand it. How about I start with uh, why I was willing to get a couple of my friends and put that much money into James's uh, idea. Well, the reality was is we were told that the robotics world was looking for a gearless motor, something that uh, would allow so many more benefits if it could be done, but it wasn't out there. There wasn't a direct drive motor that was strong enough to be able to produce the work that is needed in a robotic function. And if we could do that and have no gears, it would change everything. So James will tell you how we pulled that off, if you like, and that, that probably be helpful. Sure. So it's well known in the robotics market, because many people have tried, that a direct drive motor would be the ultimate actuator. Uh, and the problem till now is that uh, direct drive motors haven't had enough torque to be used in the joints of a robot. And so we uh, took these three foundational discoveries and applied them to robotics. They have a much wider range of application than that, but robotics is where we had identified that there's this, uh, this very well-known need for something that would eliminate all the problems with a gearbox. And a gearbox has problems of backlash. That's one of the biggest ones. The uh, non-back drivability is another one. Damage to the gears, uh, lubrication of the gears, uh, the weight, the cost, uh, the inertia is a really big one because uh, you have to speed everything up and slow everything down uh, because your motor's driving at high speed. And so we have created a solution that has three times the torque of a conventional direct drive motor. And so it's not 10 or 20 or 30 percent more, it's not an incremental improvement. We, it's a radical departure in how motors are done. And at three times the torque, we no longer need a gearbox, and we can actually use the motor as the output rather than the input to a high, high speed system. And so the effect of that is that um, you increase the speed of the output. And because of the low inertia, we can also increase the stopping speed. So we increase the production, uh, production from uh, the robot, and we increase the safety so that they can work around humans. And all of this is at a much lower cost because we've simplified, not only by removing the gearbox, but we've simplified the design of the motor itself to the point where uh, it's a fraction of the cost and it's significantly higher performance, and it meets this need that has been identified by the robotics market. Robots and learning. Yeah, I'll give you a, a rough uh, view of the way I viewed it as the investor and the team builder to give him the team he needed, and then he can give you the specifics that he would understand. So, generally speaking, our, our understanding of robotics, pretty well anything that's working in, in the industrial robotics division, they're a geared system. They're, they, they need the gears to pull off the amount of work they're doing. So we knew that that would be uh, a given. So the answer is yes there. Like what percentage of it? Yes. Um, so then it became the cobot, you know, the, the non-industrial type, you know, the one that goes in every home. It was fun because the, I would say the, little, the littlest ones, the ones that really don't have to do any work, well, could we be using that? Maybe. Do they use gears? They probably do, but we didn't really focus our understanding of that. We're focused on more ones that would be able to, you know, be uh, ones that could help in exoskeletons or rehabilitation. Uh, and, and a lot of them need the, the gears to be able to do the heavy work. And once you have to do the heavy work, that's when we replace that work. Because they're, unless they're going to use hydraulics, uh, which is a lot of, but then 
there's a whole bunch of complications you can speak to. The desire in the market was to have a non-geared solution, even in the robotic side. So I think we represent a, a significant portion of that market. Uh, they do have some solutions that are not geared, uh, but they're usually not doing any work if they are, or they have hydraulics and they maybe want to get away from those. So uh, it's a twofold question there, but it is a beautiful thing that it, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate. The live drive is we've had interviews with people. Like we just came out six weeks ago, and literally this is the first time it actually has been in public. And we have had non-stop, we've been very fortunate, we're very humbled by it, really. It's, we've spent $28 million in two and a half years of our life living in a very dark, cold place, not quite, but nobody's heard about us, our computers are offline, and then finally get to bring the baby out, and it's been so well received. And it, people have said, and just as the gentleman just did, there is no question that when I wrote my paper in 1988, I told people that the direct drive motor would change the world, it's just that it couldn't because it couldn't be made strong enough, and that's why this three times the strength, which is a non-geared, so direct drive non-geared version. So it's funny to hear a guy who written his papers on this, his PhD. So James, what percentage of the market is non-geared or geared? Yeah. Um, there's a few research robots uh, or low-powered robots that, that Michael uh, referred to where they're not actually doing any heavy lifting. Uh, where they don't have a geared system, but it's the vast majority of robots that are using gears, and uh, we believe that that every one of those robots is going to benefit from using the live drive, and we haven't had anybody dispute that yet. Uh, it's just very well known that a direct drive actuator is uh, is the answer that people have been looking for. So, uh, in terms of numbers, that's my world. Uh, I, I, you know, I supply him the team. You know, he needs a PhD engineer and mechanical or whatever. I, we find him that he likes him. We put him in the team. Key is they play well together. They respect each other. It's brilliant. But on the side, I hire people to analytical work to figure out to make sure that what we're making, what the opportunity is, what the math looks like. Um, I would just suggest that the math. You couldn't communicate the math in a way that would have a person see that it makes sense because it, it's just beyond quite reasonable. And, and the reason why that is is this, is that this is scale, well, our, our patent uh, covers from a half inch right up to the full size. So when you can take out anything, replace it, just that's, I mean, the robotic market for actuators, uh, sorry, the robotic market is currently about 30 billion. The actuator represents about uh, a third of that cost, depending on some, maybe as low as 15, 20 percent. So you got anywhere from like five or to ten billion dollars in its current size. The key to it is it will change immensely because this is what, and everybody in the robotic business, we we say, software, uh, materials, everything's come together. The mechanical side has not. This has been the hurdle, and. We actually don't get much pushback on that. So we believe it's going to take a quantum jump now because they have a direct drive. They got rid of the gears. So with that being said, what is that market? It's a bigger market than 30 billion and, you know, 30% of it. On top of that, there's things like high pressure valves. Massive market. They don't want to have gears. There's uh, the front wheel of a steering wheel. They absolutely would love your car if it's got uh, you know, if it's a new car, if they go to steer it, and yeah. uh, when it's not got any power, they won't move it. With a direct drive in there, they would. Uh, the front wheel of a bike. Um, there's multiple applications. So the markets are quite expansive, I think. Does that help yeah, answer the question? Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to add anything to that particular question? Or? Yeah, uh, motion control in general. Uh, robotics is a small part of the motion control market. We started with robotics because that's where it's most understood what the pain is. Uh, but the, the same benefits of the live drive that, uh, that will bring robotics to a new level uh, apply to, to motion control in general as well. So uh, the market is, is bigger than it's hard to put a number on as, as Michael's alluded to. So, so what just really important one that we've learned in the last three days, when the question comes down, like, well, believability, well, because everybody who's really good at things, they go, come on, you haven't done that. So the best way we can find that we can get to the answer the quickest is to ask them to bring their motor specialists in. Because those people, it's a motor, right? So it's when that person gets here, 
it's usually about 35 minutes and the question's answered. Because you can't believe it until that guy could ask himself the questions because other people, they don't believe it because they don't know what questions to ask. The guy who's been building motors or knows motors inside and out, who's read all the patents, we spent a million dollars writing these patents. We searched everything in every part of the market to understand what we were aiming at. And so when we get them sitting down here, about 30, 40 minutes, they go, okay, you did it. And, and it's quite a fascinating opportunity, but then it allows for the opportunities to exist because really, we don't actually, we just made that. We, you can make it with off the shelf stuff. You can make it anywhere in the world. But unless we get a guy with motor knowledge, we can't get them to understand it quick enough, but literally within an hour. What has been your experience in Hanover, Hanover Medicine? We, uh, we were planning on our patents coming out around August, and they came out about six weeks, they started coming, so we're upwards of five now that have been allowed, and, and they are on their way as they were. So we're going, oh, well, we're gonna have to show this now. And so one of our guys said, uh, we should probably go to Hanover. And, and we go, what's Hanover? I mean, we're from Vancouver, Canada, right? So it's like, well, the largest robotic show in the world, there are 200,000 people. Okay, we should go to Hanover. What are we gonna do? Like, what are we gonna present? And literally, it's been, it's been a six week process of going like crazy to be able to be here. But honestly, in the first day, I swear to you, this is what I thought at the end of the day. I would have come for that one day. And every day, well, it's three days now, I would have come for that day. I mean, it has been overwhelmingly incredible. This is a magnificent place with unbelievable, but to bring that many minds in one place, is a, it's a privilege to go. But when you get to show your baby that we've been birthing for two and a half years, well, his baby that we've been birthing, you know, it's, it's just been a real a gift to be here. So yeah. what do you say about the experience? Yeah, on the technical side, it's just been fantastic and very rewarding. And um, uh, the entire team, I believe, can receive the congratulations that we get from the majority of people. Like they, they'll, they'll pat us on the back and go, way to go, you did it. Right, and so like that, people that, coming by, they'll go after they go. Well, it's kind of like it's a club. It's like, well done, you did it. It's really, and I mean, can you imagine how that feels? Yeah, it's. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's been a it's been a long road to get here, uh, and there's been bumps along the way, but nothing that's sent us backwards. There's things that have slowed us down, but we finally got here. And when people understand that we can increase the speed uh, significantly, so uh, the um, uh, one of the videos that that we show is the world's fastest robot. And that was done two weeks ago, just before the show. And our team designed it in a week. And they built it. Uh, and on the second day of uh, putting it on the table, they got 50% higher speed than the world's fastest robot. And we're talking engineered, like repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. So literally three days, like two days build, test. Now pack it up, we're gonna go. And that was only using 40%? Yeah, 40% of our, of our peak torque. And so when people watch that video and you get to watch their, their, their response to it. And then when you explain that uh, the low profile of, of uh, the live drive, uh, because it's 16 millimeters thick, right? So it's a disc that you can stack and then you can put it sideways. And we put a wedge between each of the discs. And when they understand that you can use this rotary wedge configuration, which is not possible with any other actuator, it's this low profile of the live drive that enables that, we can increase the payload uh, for a given size of robot by five times or more. So when, when people understand that this is now possible, so the those light bulb big goes big on. things out there carrying cars, you can be five times that in the same space and lower cost. So and it's and a we've module. said that to them, and they haven't argued with us after they've discovered that what we did. Yeah, there's been a few people that push back a little bit, and then we just answer their questions. They go, "Well, yeah." I'm Let alone it. scaling <laughs> it down to smaller, but that's just uh, yeah. is just that. So overwhelmingly positive is, is, is the answer, and surprisingly so. Yeah, uh, I'm very grateful. Be, I guess there'd be quite a lot of skepticism for something that is, um, is making such uh, dramatic uh, claims. Uh, uh, but if you can prove what you're saying... Well, that's what we said. If you don't have a motor person, just stay around. There will be a motor person come by and watch and listen. Because, you, you know, truth shows up, right? If you have one really smart motor person, they'll have a conversation, you'll see it happen. Every single time it's happened. You know, I, we, we, that's the beautiful part. You just need to know all the right questions and then you will believe because you know what the answers to all the problems were. 
problem was heat dissipation. You had to be able to get a heat. How you hold this thing together without laminates? And there's there all the questions that are answered in that. Otherwise, you know, we spent a million dollars on the patent. We had all those engineers. We read everything that could be read, literally. We knew what the questions were. Unfortunately, we were able to find the solutions to it. I'll just describe the three foundational discoveries uh, that, that make the live drive. And the first is that uh, we figured out how to amplify the force of the permanent magnets uh, to almost two times their force if you were to use them in a conventional configuration. And so uh, that solved the problem because it gave us twice the torque but uh, it created a challenge in that the forces that are generated by those magnets would fold or collapse a conventional motor configuration. And so we discovered that instead of using laminates, which are necessary for a conventional motor, uh, the, that our geometry, which is covered by our patent, reduces the eddy currents enough that we can actually use a solid material. And so anytime you tell a, a motor designer that we're using a solid material in the stator, they'll just say, no way, I don't believe it. But when they understand what we've done with the geometry uh, in, in, in several different um, uh, respects, they, they understand how the combination of the relatively low speed of a robotic application and the special geometry that we've tied a, uh, a boundary around in our patent would combine to reduce the eddy currents enough that we can use a solid material. And then when we take the amplified magnetics and we combine them with this uh, new configuration of a stator, we made another discovery, which is that we have uh, the exponentially higher heat dissipation than you have with a conventional motor. I won't go into the details of that, but the three of those discoveries together is what gives us this three times the torque to weight. And when people understand those three steps, they don't argue. They just go, yeah, that makes perfect sense, but I can see why no one has gone there before because it's so far outside of the normal uh, electric motor design sort of constraints. I imagine you to be a bit quieter than the average gear. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and, and the, uh, the uh, vibration that's caused by gears coming together is the typical <laughs> robot noise. And, and we eliminate that uh, because we got rid of the gearbox. Uh, and then the precision uh, is something I didn't even touch on, uh, that our precision is 20 to 100 times higher than a gearbox because we don't have any backlash. And so uh, the ability to point precisely, to move precisely, uh, in addition to the, uh, the low noise and vibration is, uh, is one of the many things. We haven't even mentioned all the benefits. Uh, they're well known for a direct drive motor uh, and the noise and the, uh, and the vibration is one of them for sure.